Um, we've got a, a strategy, day, strategy day, not easy to say, uh, on Saturday morning for the elders and deacons and women's pastoral team, the pastoral team members uh, from 10 to 12. And we do that a couple of times a year. Um, and I've always believed this is not actually a biblical statement uh, exact, uh, specifically, but I think the principle is absolutely biblical. I've always believed that those who plan for nothing usually achieve it. Um, and so I think it's very important in our lives and in our churches to be people who are planning uh, and strategizing. Uh, we're image bearers of God. Uh, and he's the ultimate planner, isn't he? He's the ultimate strategist from before the foundation of the world. He has had a plan, perfect plan and a strategy uh, which is beyond our wildest imagination. So as image bearers, we reflect that uh, same kind of strategic planning and thinking, not quite obviously on the same level. But I think as when you're full time in, in ministry, uh, and as we have been together uh, over this last while, Thomas and uh, John and uh, the, the team we have, and also the elders, we do a lot of thinking. I know it sometimes might not look like that, but we do a lot of thinking and planning. Um, and prayerfully, we seek to be guided by God's word uh, with regard to our priorities and our focus, um, working within the context God has given us. And um, I think these times of strategy and planning now probably spend more, you know, go, going over what our DNA is as a church congregation, reviewing it and planning it ahead and maybe fine tuning it. Um, and I think when we do so, we, we do so remembering that God is in control. God is sovereign, as I've said, and that's a great thing. But also recognizing that, that there often comes times for reflection and renewal. Uh, and, you know, I mentioned on Sunday, this is one of these times, it's a, a, a new normal we're thinking about moving into, whatever that looks like in society. And there's, you know, changes for us and uh, changes for others who are leaving. Um, and I suppose we think about our priorities again and what that is going to look like in practice. And so it's always good to get input um, uh, from all of you. And it's good to talk to your elders, to talk to your pastoral teams, to talk to me, um, uh, to you know, know a little bit more sometimes about what we're doing, maybe asking questions, um, asking why we do certain things. Uh, we're perfectly happy to try and justify it, it. And I'm sure we get lots of things wrong. Um, but uh, we do seek to do uh, what is right. Um, and we're a family together, and so we, we build uh, forward on trust. Uh, we also build forward with the benefit of hindsight, and we pray for wisdom and strength in our weakness. And as you know, in, in our uh, vision card, uh, or our kind of character card that we have we we've got four gospel pillars um we're going to look at three of them again on saturday but uh they're in our vision statement uh, we've got four gospel uh, pillars which is worship mission discipleship and um community uh, and i just want just for a few minutes to remind ourselves of them uh and think about just very very in a very kind of shallow way uh but Firstly, think about worship uh, very briefly and Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, where Jesus is, um, so I've plucked up different verses to look at, Matthew chapter 4, 10, where Jesus is uh, being tempted by uh, Satan, where Satan uh, basically tells him to uh, bow down and worship. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And uh, we have that great reminder in Romans 12 as well, isn't it? That our lives are to be living sacrifices. Um, so our, our worship as, as a people together, it is broader than Sunday. It's broader than the church service. But I do think Sunday should be a highlight for us. I think uh, it should be, and we pray for it to be inspirational, uh, inspiring, uh, motivational, 
encouraging, challenging, educating, excellent. Um, and uh, it's important for us that we seek to do that. That involves you as you pray and listen and participate. And obviously it, it involves us. Um, and I think coming out of pandemic, um, making a good use of Sunday is going to be strategic and important for us and a challenge uh, as we move back into fellowship with one another and what we do on a Sunday and how we use Sunday and um, how best to use it in a busy and in a high octane society that we live in. And worship, of course, involves all our lives as well. It's who we are. We've given our lives to God, uh, not just our Sundays. And uh, that new commandment to uh, love one another uh, as he has loved us is an expression of our worship. And I think sometimes for us, it's easy to lose sight of that. It's easy for us to make idols, to change our focus, to get sidetracked by life uh, and forget what is weighty and forget who gets the glory, because that's really what worship is, isn't it? I, uh, Katrina and I sat last night and uh, uh, went on to Amazon Prime and watched the Alex Ferguson film. So it's basically a, a very personal, obviously for, for me, who's interested in football, I found it very interesting, uh, a personal look at his life, particularly since he had a brain hemorrhage. So it's much more personal than the football side, really looks at his life and his upbringing and it was a, it's a fantastic film and he's a, a tremendous individual and he has achieved so much in life but both of us looked at each other at the end and said this is he's it's great and exciting but a real sadness too that he comes to his end of his life he's af afraid of dying he speaks about death and he has no hope without Christ and there was a real sense of emptiness there um, if he's not a Christian, which he doesn't appear to be. Um, and the glory that he has given, uh, he's received and also he has poured out in the pursuit of, of his uh, game. It really was tinged with sadness, but you should watch it. It's a brilliant program and a, a brilliant cat and much to to just marvel at uh, God's gifts in people and uh, the various uh, characteristics that we can learn from. So I think worship is very significant and central. And of course, so is uh, mission. Uh, that's the second of our pillars uh, in our vision statement. And in Acts, uh, 20, uh, Acts 17, uh, at verse um 29, Paul, as a, you know, a famous evangelistic message in Athens, Paul says, therefore, since we are God offspring, we should not think that the divine being is uh, like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given a proof of this by raising him, rising him from the dead. And uh, that, I think, has to remain or become our great motive for mission, is that there is a judgment day. And we will all stand before God on that great judgment day. There's an honesty about our lives that needs to reflect that. There's an urgency and there's a sacrificial love. Then. What a great challenge it is for us, mission to love people and to relate to them, to know how they think so that we can bring the gospel into their thinking. Increasingly, I don't think it's a formula. Uh, I think it's a, a wise recognition of uh, sharing Jesus Christ who has transformed our lives uh, with them. Uh, I think it's gonna be messy for us uh, because life is messy. Um, we believe in mission. We believe in planting churches. We believe in personal mission, sharing our faith, and also partnership together, uh, obviously with God uh, and with others. And uh, that isn't so much about a technique. I think it's just how Jesus is impacting us uh, will enable us 
to share that transformation with others. It takes courage, it takes compassion, it takes conviction. And it'll also take rejection because some people will not accept it, of course. But we'll still keep loving them and we'll still keep praying for them. And uh, we'll not, we'll not uh, uh, aggravate them, we'll not harass them, but uh, we'll uh, continue to show the grace of God in their lives. And, and mission uh, and how that works out together and individually is very important as we think forward. But also the third thing is discipleship, equipping discipleship. And that's very much important part of our ongoing work. I read there from First Thessalonians. And it's a great wee passage. And um, Paul's really speaking about his work among them, which was that he made disciples. That's what he did. Um, and I think, I, lo I love the phrase that seems to be quite trendy just now, uh, that we are to be... Uh, making disciples, uh, we're disciple making disciples so that we are disciples and we encourage others to also be disciples. Uh, we want to have converts who we will then disciple. Uh, and that is gonna be a challenge. Uh, Hamish and Anna have just had a new baby and it's transformed their lives. And we've seen that with Scott and Amy in the last few while and, and lots of others. And what, what do we notice most about that? Is their lives are turned upside down. Uh, when new life comes into the home uh, and everything is focused on caring for and, and nourishing that child and that will be the same if God blesses us with converts you know uh, making disciples not just converts but disciples will turn our lives and our church upside down well for good though for good because it will really give us a reason uh for being much more serious about our faith, I think sometimes. Um, I very, uh, in a very mischievous and bad way, uh, mimicked Thomas on Sunday morning by rolling up my sleeves. But you know, that's exactly what we need to do. Uh, if God will bless us and uh, as we work, uh, it's the unglamorous work of discipling one another. That's not, not just waiting for new people, but at the moment, keeping doing it serving one another, serving even in the church, you know, the welcoming, the creche, the kids' church, the rotas, the family that we're seeking to maintain. We're not wanting to maintain an institution. It's a family. You know, it's really interesting. I don't know if you noticed it in the passage in Thessalonians when Paul is describing how he disciples them. Do you notice how he does it? He says, I'm like a mother with you. And then he says, I'm like a father with you. It's really tremendous. Uh, he speaks in, in, in these two ways uh, about the way he cared for them and discipled them. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And then later on, he says, for we know, uh, in verse 11, like a father with his children, how we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you. Isn't that great? That it's, it's not, our discipling is to be familial. It's to be family oriented. It's like how we would treat our children. And that's how we disciple one another. Um, and that, that's really important. And I think in our church family, discipling one another involves getting beyond the surface, doesn't it? It's getting beyond just saying, hello, how are you? I'm fine, yes. How are you? Oh yeah, I'm very well as well. And becoming Jesus people together and sharing our faith and being accountable to one another and loving and serving one another and um, you know uh, I think the city groups are a great place for that to happen it's tough uh, but it's great um, and I think again can I just say with new Christians when we pray for and when we see new Christians maybe maybe particularly new Christians that will come with a very different world view maybe some some of the girls from Sparkle Sisters or uh, someone from Narcotics Anonymous or Maybe if we're sharing our faith with a, a married gay couple and uh, one of them is converted, that's going to be a, a journey of discipleship with them. It's, it's not going to be instantly mature uh, nine to five Christians that have got all the answers and know how to live. There'll be one step forward sometimes, two steps back. There'll be tears and there'll be brokenness. 
But that's what we're called to do in discipleship. It's not clean cut and it's not always easy. And then the last thing is community. Um, and again, I think that's such a crucial part of what we are and what we want to be more and more. Um, we're, ado we're adopted into God's family and, and, and I'm, I keep speaking in that context of family. And I, I do think there's an overwhelming loneliness in, in the lost world around us and sometimes in our own hearts. Um, I think this has been a year of isolation for many and there'll be a, a readjustment for us coming out of that, learning a new social skills, um, learn, learning how to cook again for other people uh, as we open our home and things like that. Um, but genuinely, I think, interestingly, I think community is the outworking of the other three, worship, mission, and discipleship. It kind of is the glue for them all. Um, and as we are doers of the word and not hearers only, part of that is just living and working at community. I, I Honestly, and this is not, a, I'm not making excuses here and I'm not passing responsibility, but I don't think it primarily is something that's centrally organized uh, or centrally driven, certainly motivated and encouraged. But I, I think it's, it's each of our responsibility, every one of us. Uh, and, and however that works out, you know, that's where we all matter together. I think we're wrong if we have a hierarchy in the church. Yes, we have biblical structure and we have leadership, but there's a huge variety of gifts and there's equality between us all. And I often feel those who do the unseen work in St. Columbus or indeed in any church are the most important and the ones who will be nearest the throne room in heaven. So moving forward, I think we need each other. And uh, in community, we're going to look out, I hope, for one another. Uh, look out particularly for those who are in most need. And uh, as we serve one another and as we forget ourselves, we become most fulfilled, I think. So we're looking to open our homes and our hearts, uh, whatever gifts we have in that area. Um, and can I just encourage you again, as you've always been brilliant at doing, that vital work of, of welcoming new people when they come into our fellowship or into uh, our gospel community informally, however that looks um, for any of us. Let's be really strategic and de de deliberate about that. And it does involve a deliberation. It involves an intentionality to look across the shoulders of the friend that you're speaking to and uh, embracing uh, the visitor, the new person among us. So uh, it's something that we need to work hard at because we're a gathered people. It's something that the, the, the city groups hope to form as well, but it is hard. I know it's hard work and maybe it's something we're we think is a struggle as we come out of uh, this time of, of um, isolation. But I, I hope that gently and slowly um, that we'll reconfigure ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm really excited moving forward. I'm excited for Thomas starting in Carloway and what that looks like. I'm excited for the partnership we share. I'm also excited for us. Uh, God's stripping us back. He's, he's going to refresh us. We're going to be refocused. Uh, whatever we do, we're going to need to keep prayer critical to our moving forward. And I honestly believe that God will continue to surprise us, energize us, stick with us, and uh, um, bless us as we focus on him. And please pray for the next steps. And uh, please be part of that. Uh, and please own uh, the work. Um, it's something that's very exciting. Um, and remember that uh, the work of the gospel is very much uh, not about them. It's about us, the work of the church. It's, it's, it's not my work. Um, you take that onus and you take that responsibility. It's our family together. 
And just as I close, that um, you remember uh, that as we move forward, uh, we look to call again another assistant minister. Um, and you know, in our context, we've known about Thomas finishing for several months. Um, and obviously, a number of months ago, we set things in motion by asking the congregation if they were willing for us and happy for us to pursue the possibility of Corey coming as a potential replacement. And at the time you gave that the green light. And uh, we talked then and we've prayed all the way through about God opening doors and opening doors at the right time and continuing to guide us. And it's been tough because it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation with legislation and with timing and uh, calling someone that has to become a minister first. So there's a commitment before we're even calling. But throughout it all, we've, we've tried to do things properly and in the right time, which is why we haven't said a lot about it up till now. You know, some people have been asking, well, what's happening? What's going to happen? Uh, but um, Thomas has still been with us, and that's significant. And formally, we obviously couldn't do anything um, anyway. So we have tried to do that, and um, we've seen the doors opening in terms of the process that Corey has gone through with Presbytery, Board of Ministry, General Assembly. He's now a free church minister in a uh, an unusual position of being a free church minister working uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, Thomas's finishing date uh, isn't till this Sunday. Uh, so we, we weren't wanting to and wouldn't have done anything before then. But following uh, that, we'll put out a letter with more details. And I think on Sunday, I said it was going to be a week tonight, the congregational meeting. Sorry, that was wrong. Uh, it was originally then, but I forgot it was a five Wednesday month. So it's, we'll, we'll do this city group uh, as a follow on from this uh, prayer meeting as we have been doing. And then on the 26th, which is two weeks tonight. Sorry, 23rd. Is it? So that's my wife keeping me right. What's the date? Okay, sorry. It's just getting to that time of year. Anyway, it's two weeks tonight, whatever the date is. Uh, we'll be having a congregational meeting to, uh, we will propose as elders the election uh, of Corey uh, to forward to the presbytery. And hopefully then, if that happens, the presbytery uh, will come and uh, oversee the signing of a call in uh, July. But that's just where we are. And... Um, uh, in July and August, all the Wednesday evenings will be engine rooms, uh, just to give city group meetings a formal rest and break. And and I was going to say for all the <laughs> all the homes that host them, but you haven't you haven't been hosting, so it's not a break from that point of view. But uh, I would encourage you to meet up in ones and twos uh, together, uh, either on a Wednesday or um, any other time. Pray together, be together. Uh, but we'll continue uh, on Zoom for the Wednesday uh, during July and August in the summer. And then hopefully we'll be back to meeting together in person, physically, uh, and uh, rebooting the, the uh, city groups in September as we hope to do. So we're excited about that. And we're excited for what God has to do. Isn't it great? This is his kingdom. And his kingdom is coming and his will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. So uh, we'll be thinking about some of these things on Saturday morning as well. And please speak to any of your elders or any of the elders or any of your pastoral team or me or uh, Thomas or John or anyone about things. And um, we just look forward to what God has in store for us together. Amen.